Okay, hi there, and welcome to the sixth in our series of six uh, videos of looking at your key micro diagrams for your A-level economics. Uh, we've covered markets, market failure, government intervention, theory of the firm, market structures, and in this sixth video, we're going to take a look at some of the key labour market analysis diagrams. As always, very useful to have your revision notes, your class notes, easily to hand so that you can check through your notes and your diagrams and make a uh, make a check as we go through. Uh, we're going to assume some prior knowledge of labour market economics. We'll go th this will take about 15 minutes to work through, but we're going to assume you've done some revision. And this is just a kind of supplementary support session for you. Hopefully it'll be useful. Uh, some boards require you to understand marginal revenue product, MRPL, which is essentially the revenue a firm gets from employing extra workers. Uh, it's uh, the marginal product of workers, as you employ extra people, times by the price of the output when you sell the product. You can see here that after the fourth, after the third worker, sorry, marginal product is declining from 20 to 16 to 12 to 8. If we're selling each unit for $20, then we can see the marginal revenue product of labour is also declining. A profit maximising firm will employ workers up to the point where the marginal revenue product of labour equals the marginal cost of labour. So they'll employ the fifth worker, they add 240 to revenue, only cost them 160. The sixth worker, yes, they'll employ them, they both, they both equal $160. But the seventh worker, you get 80 revenue, but it costs you 160 to employ, therefore you lose profits from employing the seventh worker. We'll come back to that when we come to the analysis diagrams. Labour demand. Uh, you need to understand what might cause shifts in labour demand outwards or inwards. We'll, we'll do the diagrammatic work on that in a second or two. I think what's really crucial is to understand elasticity of labour demand and elasticity of labour supply. In our diagram on the left, labour demand is highly wage elastic. Typically, this is an occupation where wage costs are a big percentage of total costs. And also, it's fairly easy, if needs be, to substitute uh, capital for labour. So things like security guards or whatever, or digital businesses where you can use a lot of capital instead of employing lots of workers. It also depends, of course, on the ability of firms to pass on an increase in wage costs to the final consumer in the form of a higher price. So on the left-hand side, you have a fairly elastic labour demand curve. On the left, on the right-hand side, you have a fairly inelastic demand curve, where a big, a big increase in wages actually only causes a small contraction, a small fall in employment. Again, typically here, this is where labour is specialised, it's needed. Capital can't necessarily replace labour very easily. Likewise, on the supply side, to an occupation, uh, whatever it is, this, this on the labour supply side, this could be bar staff or clerical staff, for example, people working in farming or, or uh, who knows, hospitality. The labour supply curve tends to be fairly elastic in relatively low skilled jobs. Please, in an exam, please don't use the phrase unskilled work because there is no such thing as unskilled work. Every job requires some, some functional skill. But in this situation, on the left-hand side, the labour supply curve is fairly elastic at a low wage. On the right-hand side, labour supply drawn as more inelastic, wage inelastic. Uh, perhaps the supply of labour is limited by the need for specialist skills, high-level qualifications and extensive training periods. In the exam, when you're talking about wage differentials and things, make it clear about the elasticity. You know, make a very nice distinction between the two. Uh, some, some exam boards require you to look at the individual labour supply decision and in particular what's called the income and substitution effects. Let me just take you through this. If you don't require this, you can skip forward um, a slide or two, a couple of minutes. On the left hand side here, normally uh, the higher the wage, the greater are the hours that people would be willing and able to work, um, assuming they can change the hours they work. Uh, largely because uh, as, as as wages go up, the opportunity cost of leisure increases and there's quite a strong substitution effect to work longer hours. However, as the wage rate goes up, it may well be the case that eventually workers start substituting leisure for work. Perhaps they have a strong income elasticity demand for, for leisure uh, 
they've reached their target income and a higher wage in this right hand side here can actually cause people either just to keep the same hours vertical alignment there or in fact at very high wages people may start to say well actually you know I'd prefer to work four days a week instead of five I prefer to take uh, you know shorter hours and my labor supply curve actually in that situation could well uh, bend backwards people may prefer leisure to work at very high wage rates much depends on the context the situation of the person and the family involved so that's the, the so-called the famous the infamous backward bending labor supply curve what a diagram but moving on so once you've got your labor demand and labor supply curves in place uh, for most exam boards it's a question of just understanding shifts and curves and the consequences both for wages and the consequences for employment the equilibrium wage is where labor demand and labor supply meet and of course any change in this in the shifts in the curves can bring about expansions and contractions of employment on the right hand side we see an outward shift of labor demand causing an expansion of labor supply and a higher wage and a higher level of employment equally we can take a on the left hand side here, left hand side here an outward shift of labor supply maybe an influx of workers into a particular occupation which other things remaining the same or ceteris paribus will bring down the equilibrium wage and also lead to an expansion along the employment line on the right hand side here a, a, a recession perhaps don't forget labor has a derived demand what could be automation robotics replacing labor at each wage rate either way the labor demand curve shifts to the left and that causes a contraction of uh, labor supply fall in employment and also a decrease in wages the crucial thing i think here is uh, don't be afraid just to use your labor demand and labor supply curves to tell a story but also crucially also link to wages and employment Live, link to both of the axes here again some exam boards not many require you to understand the concepts of transfer earnings and economic rent so if you're not part of the syllabus on this one skip forward transfer earnings is the minimum earnings that labor requires to remain in occupation and it's the area underneath the labor supply curve in gray shown by the area o b c d economic rent is the wage above the minimum people would need to be in a certain occupation it's the area above the labor supply curve and below the wage equal to the area a b c the total factor reward of course is the wage times employment OACD. When labor supply is relatively inelastic, uh, then oftentimes the wage that people are getting is a premium above what they would be willing to to uh, work for. So typically, when the labor supply curve is inelastic, then most of the reward to labor will be rent, or an increasing proportion will be rent compared to transfer earnings. Again, this tends to be boards like OCR that have have these kind of questions, and they are scintillatingly fun. I'm sure you'll agree. Now, this bit is important, particularly if you want to understand the dynamics of monopsony and also the labour markets of a trade union and a minimum wage. So take a moment to stay with me on this one. It's important in understanding the labour market to think about the difference between the average cost of labour, the cost per worker, if you like, per hour, across the entire labour force employed, and the marginal cost of labour, which is the cost to the firm of adding an extra worker to the labor force. Take a look at the one on the left hand side. Let's assume that we can get as many workers as we need at 50 pounds per worker per day, let's say, in which case the average cost is always the same at 50 and each extra worker will cost 50 pounds. And in that situation, that's a perfectly elastic supply curve, by the way, the marginal cost of labor equals the average cost of labor at 50 pounds. On the right hand side, however, is a slight differential here. In this case, we assume that to get extra workers, we might have to pay a higher wage to attract the workers in. And if a business, if an employer has to pay higher wages to attract extra workers, then the average cost of labor rises to bid up the wage per hour, let's say, from I don't know, 30 pounds to 32 pounds or 35 pounds. And of course, assuming you pay everybody uh, the extra wage, then the marginal cost of labor uh, rises more steeply. You won't have to prove this in the exam, calculate it at all, um, unless it's a really sneaky exam. The crucial thing is just to understand that's what happens. This leads us on to monopsony. 
Again, uh, some exam boards require you to have the monopsony diagram. I'm just going to go with, through it uh, with you pretty quickly. Uh, other boards don't. But even those that don't, it's kind of quite a fun to understand the slightly counterintuitive argument that uh, comes to the end here. Here we go. This is a monopsony. This is a monopsony employer, a business that has significant buying power in the labour market. The profit maximising level of employment is where marginal labour cost, MCL, meets the marginal revenue product. Go back to that example we had right at the start. So this firm will employ uh, E2 number of people. Uh, now the marginal revenue product, the productivity times by the price, is valued at W2. And actually, although they're employing E2 people, they don't have to pay them W2. They use the labour supply curve, average cost of labour, to determine the wage that they can pay to get the workers they need. So the monopsony the employer, in theory, in theory, can pay a wage of W3. As a result, the total wages are shown in the blue area. But in fact, you can make a case for saying that really the monopsony employer should be paying more. Just as I speak, as I look out of the window, a delivery driver, a rider is passing by. Are they being paid a wage which reflects their marginal revenue product? I might knock on the window and ask him. But the monopsony employer can use their buying power to pay a wage lower than the value of MRP. So this is a really key theoretical point. In that sense, a firm with significant buying power in the labour market could well exploit the people that they employ. Now, this is where it gets intuitive and interesting. If you then say, OK, you're paying W3, we don't think that's high enough. We're going to impose a minimum wage a pay floor in the labour market, a statutory minimum wage. Some people call it a living wage. It's not, it's a minimum wage. So let's, let's assume this is enforced in the labour market. What that means is that the marginal cost of employing labour is now constant at the green line, up to the employment level E4, where it meets the average cost of labour. And thereafter, we get that divergence effect again. Marginal cost starts to diverge from average cost. But if W min... W min is, a, is now the marginal cost of labour, then a profit maximising employer will employ people now, uh, employ E3 number of people. That's where marginal labour cost meets marginal revenue product at the level of employment E3. And they're getting paid the minimum wage. This leads to the slightly counterintuitive point that in a monopsony situation, uh, an employer, if you enforce a minimum wage on the labour market, you might end up with higher employment at a higher wage than you had before. Original wage was W3, E2 employed. The wage now is W min with E3 employed. Quite important analysis. In fact, really important analysis because it suggests that a minimum wage could actually increase employment. Another aspect of labour market economics, which many of you will be writing about, and hopefully many of you scoring top marks for analysis, is the possible impact of a trade union in the labour market. So trade unions, of course, represent their members collectively to bargain with employers, to bargain with firms and businesses in the hope of winning better pay and conditions. Here's our diagram. So the original equilibrium wage, let's say, is W1, labour demand, labour supply. Now unions might bid uh, to employers, bargain with employers to pay a premium wage or a markup. Let's say W2. The union negotiates a wage W2. Now in theory that might lead to an excess supply of labour and a contraction of employment. So on the one hand, uh, there's some lost wage income from the fact that employment has fallen from E1 to E2. But there's a wage premium for those people who uh, keep their job. The crucial bit, the crucial bit is the elasticity of demand for labour. So the extent to which unions will be successful in lifting pay and the total earnings of their members depends on the wage elasticity of demand for labour. If you take, for example, London underground tube drivers, they're pretty well paid. They've got a powerful trade union representing them and the demand for their services remains fairly inelastic for the moment. But who knows? with uh, driverless trains kicking in, uh, 
that might change in the past. The crucial thing here is really the credible threat power of the unions. How much influence, how much power realistically uh, do they have on the market? A uh, couple of a uh, couple of little slides to finish with. Uh, the idea of bilateral monopoly. So a bilateral monopoly is where you have a monopsony on the one hand, which tends to drive wages down, and you have a monopoly supply of labour, a union, for example, which tends to keep wages high. So the monopsony wage tends to be W one in this situation. Going back to our original diagram, uh, the union might want to wage W two. Where do we end up? Well, it depends on the relative, the relative bargaining power of the unions compared with the, with the monopsony employer. And of course, that can change. It can change with the economic cycle. It can change with changing technology, uh, political situation. Where you end up is uncertain. Very quick couple of slides. Thank you for staying with us. If you got all the way to the end, you win a prize. Uh, very quick couple of slides on minimum wage. I just want to take you through a really better diagram. So minimum wage, of course, is you have to set it above the free market wage. Let's say it was W1, that's too low maybe. So you set the minimum wage at W2. That, in theory, causes a contraction of employment, expansion of labour supply, and can then lead to an excess supply of labour. OK, fine. I think a really good approach in the exam is to say, well, this, this depends on so many factors. Labour demand might not be the same. Labour supply might change, but crucially, change the elasticity. The Here's our diagram on the right-hand side. What I've done on the left-hand side is just replicated the one on, on the previous slide. So uh, a minimum wage where labour demand is inelastic, inelastic uh, means that there's less of a fall in labour demand, and therefore, as a result, you can see an increase in the total earnings to labour. Impact of minimum wage depends fundamentally, crucially, on the wage elasticity of demand for labour. There we go. There's a lot of stuff in labour markets. I think labour markets is really interesting. Lots of stuff you can write about. Hopefully this video has been helpful in giving you some of the key analysis diagrams that will get you some top marks. Thanks for joining in and I hope you, got, I hope you found the six videos useful. Now it's over to you.